Hi, my name is Carla Zulamar, and I'm a patent attorney. And I don't know if you guys came to some of your classes, but I, I teach another class, which is just the basics of patent law. You know, covers trademarks, uh, patent law, or uh, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. I just want to see if this is recording. It looks like we are live. Okay. So, uh, just a little background. I'm an electrical engineer. I worked at uh, Hughes Aircraft, and then uh, Hughes Aircraft was laying off, and they laid off about 40,000 out of 80,000 employees, so I, I became a patent attorney. And I've been working with the little people, and that's the startups, the small inventors, and universities. Uh, and it's a very difficult market because they don't have the funds, you know, to, to do patents like a lot of the bigger corporations. Uh, so what I've done is I started, uh, you know, my model is that I try to teach people how to fish rather than sell them the fish. Uh, the conventional model is, hey, you know, I'll sell you as many fish as you can buy. Uh, my model is, you know, how can I teach you everything that I know so that you can start, so you can learn how to write patent applications and thereby minimize costs. So I'm going to cover basically, uh, you know, my preferred method of working uh, with with potential clients and clients. And if you go to this meetup, there is there is a bunch of stuff that I posted. These two webinars are some webinars that cover the patent basics and sort of how to analyze a patent. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at these. Um, and then this is the Facebook group here that you guys can join uh, uh, if you send me an email or I, I don't know if you click on the link if you can. It's a secret group, so I don't know. I'll, I'll have to work it out. But anyways, I'll, I'll get you guys in there if you want to join. And the files and stuff will be there. And basically, we're going to be looking at, you know, what is a patent application and, and what do I need from you guys in order to minimize my time? And it's pretty straightforward. I'm very, very methodical uh, when I write patent applications. And basically, I like you to think of the patent application as made up of three things. Okay. And I'm going to be we're going to be looking at an actual patent application over here. Uh, this is actually one that just got granted. Uh, this is I'm using my own patent because that way you know I don't have to worry about disparaging other people's work. But uh, this is. Uh, an aquaponics system that I built uh, in my backyard. And we're going to use this as an example of what are the parts of the patent. And if you look at it, this is the this is the actual published patent application. So after you file a patent application, it gets published. And you'll see that the publication has certain information. It has the inventorship, uh, the date of publication. It also has related cases over here. It has the publications that were cited, or I'm sorry, the classification, how, how the invention is classified. And there's the abstract, and then there's a representative figure. Uh, they always put on the front page a figure that's representative of the invention. And that's because one patent application could have many, many inventions. In fact, this particular patent application, I think I'm up to the fourth patent. So there's four different things that I've gone after so far. And each one has a different drawing. So this was the, the filter uh, in the aquaponics system, and that's why this is shown uh, on the first page. So let's talk about the parts of a patent application. So there's the what, where I like to start with patents, and, and for myself being an engineer, uh, is the drawings. Okay, uh, the, the drawings are what you use to describe the patent application. So I like to be very methodical when I write my own patent applications. For example, when I wrote this application on the aquaponic system, I always start up at the highest level. And sorry that this is sideways. I might be able here. Hold on a second. Let me show you another version. Oops. Damn it. Do that. Okay. Yeah, I think this one is a little bit better. Okay. 
So you can see here that, that there's the drawings, which are always listed first when, you pu when the application gets published. The abstract is, is just based on the claims, but let's go through the most important part. I think the drawings are the good starting point, and I will tell you how I do my drawings. It's very methodical. Uh, if you guys have been engineers, you've probably heard of top-down design. Top-down design means that you start at the highest level, and you describe the highest level, and then the next drawings give you more details of that higher level. So, for example, if you look at this drawing, and I apologize that it's sideways, uh, you see that this is sort of like if you were looking from above on my aquaponics system, this is the greenhouse, this is what you would see. And it's actually built pretty close to this, actually. So this is the south view right here, and there's vents along the south. And then you have glazing right here. And then here's the north roof, and here's some north vents. Here's my fish pond. Here's my grow beds. And as you can see, every single component in the drawing has a number. And if you notice, this is figure one, and you notice that every single thing has a number that's a one series, uh, 102, 104, 106, 108. The reason I like to do that is because I like to write applications that make it easy for the examiner or somebody that's reading the application to understand the invention. When you're filing a patent application at the patent office, Whatever you can do to make it easier for the examiner to understand the invention quickly, uh, you know, examiners don't have a lot of time, so if you can make it easier for them, it's going to be beneficial for them trying to get your case allowed. So, for example, figure one has 100 series numbers. So, for example, uh, you see down there it says top view 100. That's the system. That, that system 100 is my aquaponics greenhouse at the very highest level. And it shows if you're looking down from above, you would see all the components that would make up the aquaponic system from a top view. Now, from there, I start getting into more detail. Now, here's a side view. And you notice on the side view that every number that was 100 series keeps its number. So this is 118, and that's because the number tells you where to look on the drawing. So, for example, if you're looking at figure two and you see 118, you know that that first appeared on figure one. Does that make sense to everybody? So what, what that means is figure one gets 100 series numbers, 102, 104, 106. And by the way, I like to use even numbers, and there's a, a reason for that. If later on you make a change, you have all the odd numbers to go after. So, for example, if you do 102, 104, 106, 108, and let's say you got all the way up to 198, you know, right before 200. And you say, oh, no, i got to add a component. Well, since you've skipped every other number, you've got 101, 103, 105, in case you want to change something down the road. Because, you know, part of what I like to do is efficiency. And, you know, by doing the even numbers, if you need to add something, you can very easily insert it, insert it into one of the odd numbers. So, for example... This right here, 202, the reason it's number 202 is because this is the first time it appeared in figure 2. And, and 202 is actually talking about the insulation on the greenhouse, which wasn't shown in the previous figure. And that's why it gets number 202. But you notice, for example, vent 120, you know, glazing 118. And if we go back over to here, you'll see that all those numbers had appeared in figure one. So basically, figure one gets 100 series numbers, figure two gets 200 series numbers, figure three gets 300 series numbers, dot, dot, dot. Figure 10 gets 1,000 series numbers. You can go on forever. You know, figure 12 is 1,200 series numbers, 1202, 1204, 1206. And this way, when you're reading the application, you know, the reason I do this is just by looking at the number when you're sitting there going through a 50-page spec and you go, you know, the widget 304, and you're trying to find it, you know that it has to be on figure three because it's 304. And a lot of people don't do that, and it's super frustrating reading an application where people just number from one to a thousand, irrespective of the figure number. And you're sitting there reading the application, you get 
element number 34, and you got to go through 50 pages of drawings to find out where the heck number 34 shows up. So I go ahead. So since most people don't do this, do you just let the examiner know if you like to say? You just describe saying the numbering system is based on this. No, you don't have to describe it to them. Well, they'll appreciate it. You know, when I was an examiner, I saw this number, and I was like, "Wow, this is great. He's making my job easier." Okay. And you know, uh, examiners have a lot of power. You make their job easier, and it's going to be easier for them to allow it. So. So as you can see, we went from a very you know broad high level. Now we're getting into more detail. This actually talks about the angle of the glazing. Uh, this is a Chinese solar greenhouse, which uh, maximizes the, the winter solstice sun. You know, so that glazing right there is actually at the proper angle for the latitude in my backyard. And here's the calculations right here for the latitude. It's, sorry that it's sideways, but uh, you know. I, I calculated latitude, and based on that, I figured out what the ang angle um, uh, for the glazing should be. I'll, I'll recap real quick. Okay. I don't want to distract. No problem. So, uh, so as you can see, now we're getting into more detail, and as we go further, even more detail. Now we're going into the individual components that make up the various parts of Figure One. So, Figure Three, for example is potential vent layout, okay? You notice figure three doesn't have any new numbers? That's because really figure three is just another view showing how the vents could be configured in various ways. They're not new vents, they're the same vents that were shown in figure one, but I'm just showing that, you know, the possible configurations of the various vents. Uh, now if you go to figure four, you see there's a lot of 400 numbers there because that is the first time I've described element 122, the black soldier fly fish feeder, in detail. So if you go back to figure one, you're going to see just a box that says BSF on it, you know, BSF uh, 122. Now you see exactly what makes up that component. And that's what I mean by top down. You know, figure one shows everything at a high level, and now figure four shows the details of one of those components which is the black soldier fly feeder. Same thing with figure five, that was a rack, rocket mass heater, you know, and now I'm showing uh, how that rocket mass heater could be configured as a fish tank heater. You know, you have you put wood in one side, I don't know if you guys are familiar with rocket stoves, but they work off of the chimney effect. And, and basically, you know, you put in, you put in wood and that, that, that L shape causes a, a chimney effect it actually superheats the, the, the fire and sucks air in the other end. And I was thinking if you wrap um, you know, some metal coils around it, and I actually did this, uh, and add some electronic valves, you can actually make you know, potentially a fish tank heater using twigs. Uh, I actually made one to make a Vietnamese coffee when I go camping. I, I took my rocket stove and wrapped some tubes around it, and I pour water in one end, and boiling hot water comes out the other end, you can make a water heater out of them. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with rocket stoves. So the reason I'm spending so much time on the drawings is because this is the way I write a patent application. I would recommend that this is the way you approach it. Uh, you know, I'm an engineer, and at the end of the day, everything is visual for me. You know, I have to see it. I have to picture it in my mind. You know, I, I have to draw it. So whenever I'm working on an application, I start at the highest level and draw the high-level version of it. Then I then keep going down in detail. And once I have all my drawings made, I go and methodically label everything, 102, 104, 106, 202, 204, 208, 302. Once I have my drawings completely labeled, and, and you want to put them in the order that you're going to describe them. So part of... You know, part of the, the, the drawings is to put the drawings in the order that you're going to describe them in the detailed description. Because the next part I'm going to talk about, we've talked about the drawings, and I think this is where we should start. Uh, typically, when clients work with me, I, ha I have them do the drawings first. I want to be able to look at the drawings, understand what's happening before I even read it. If I can't look at the drawings and at least get a pretty decent idea of what they're doing, I'm going to say, look, you need more detail here. For example, if we go back to the black soldier fly uh, fish feeder, you know, up here it's a black box. 
you 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 can you, part of getting a patent is you have to describe how to make and use your invention so that somebody of ordinary skill in the art can make and use your invention without undue experimentation. What that means is I can't say I've got a black soldier fly auto fish feeder. Oh, it's this box. Trust me, it works. That, that you, you can't do that in a patent application. You actually have to describe how all the components in the invention work. Now, there's a limit, and software is a good example. You know, when you're doing a software-related invention, you know, you don't need to get down to the firmware level. You know, they're, they're, you know, you don't have to get down to the source code level. You know, typically for software, it's the flowchart level. You know, it's it's a flowchart that you could hand to somebody and say, hey, I want you to program this in Perl, I want you to program it in Java or whatever the language du jour is. So, so again, even with software, you start at a high level, high level flow diagram, and then for the sub the subflows, you break them down in separate um, drawings. A good example is uh, uh, one of the samples that you're going to see in the files is a cheap prevention system for online video gaming. Now, this is a mechanical invention, but what I'm talking about applies really to all inventions. You know, you want to start from the top and work down. And for example, in the cheap prevention system, uh, there's a high level diagram that shows what the hardware looks like from above. And you see a server, you see some game clients, you see some game servers, and you see some files being transferred back and forth. Now when you get to the, so that's sort of the hardware description, you know, because when you give me a, a, an application that's computer related, I want to see the hardware specification and I want to see the software specification. And you can't tell me it's only software because software does not exist without hardware. You know, I want to see what, where is this software being used? How is it being used in the system? So that that way we can try to protect that if needed. So typically with respect to software related inventions, I start with I'm a hardware guy. I apologize, Gracie, to hardware design. So I always start with the hardware, but I have a reason for that. Software does not exist without hardware, so I figure in my own mind it makes sense to describe the hardware first and then how the software operates within the hardware. And I know there's some software people here. For example, in software-related inventions, you might have one, you know, the hardware level view, and you describe how, how your software functions at the hardware level, and then you might go, for example, the view from the server. What is the flow chart that the server is seeing? The server is receiving files, he's sending files, he's you know, creating things. You know, what's the view from the client? Each one of those could be a separate drawing uh, related to the top level uh, diagram. Question on that. Yes, um, sir. So you have like a system level overview of yeah. the application, right? Uh, and I know I watched the videos. You talked yeah. about how you want to patent each piece yes. of the client interface. The right, right. Interface. So, what if you have a use case? If you miss a use case, right? I mean, how does that like? Well, you know, that's a good question, and, and it, it relates to the problem that every inventor has, and Danette can vouch for this. Is that you know, if you wait till you have every possible implementation done, you're never going to file a patent. You're going to be sitting there going, oh, yeah, but I could change this, and I could change that, and I could change this, and you'll never file it. So, you know, right now, the United States is first to file. What that means is if you two guys are working on the exact same thing, if you go to the patent office first, you win, no matter what. It used to be that the, the first inventor wins. Whoever came up with it first and was working on it wins. Uh, the corporations changed that, and they made it now first to file, which means... Whoever runs to the patent office first wins. So the advice that patent attorneys are giving, which is great advice if you're a patent attorney, file early and file often. So inventors are caught in this sort of double-edged sword of, you know, at what level do you want to disclose it, you know, so that you can get that, so you can cut off that date, you know, because as soon as you get that filing done, that means you've got a mark in the sand that says, on this day, I invented this. So if you're... If you're, if you're waiting to, to do further developments, that gate keeps slipping, but there's a way, and, and I'll talk about that. It's a little bit more advanced, but the United States has something called provisional applications, and this is something that applies to Danette here also who's doing some mechanical stuff. I won't talk about his stuff because I can't, but basically, you know, he's got embodiments right now that he wants to patent. 
The problem is he's got other iterations of it, you know, and what you can do is you can follow a provisional application on your first idea. You're like, this is what I think it's going to work like, and you follow a provisional case on that. Within 12 months, you have to do something with that provisional, and within that 12 months, you can update that provisional. So what I do in, in situations like you're talking about, that you find another use case that's very important, is I ask you a very important question. At what level is this invention? Is it going to change over the next year? Now, if you're talking software or a new type of hardware, I can guarantee you it's going to change. I've worked on hardware projects and software projects. I've never seen a design that doesn't change from you know, pre-alpha to release. I've never, ever seen one. Something is going to change. In that situation, you can use a provisional patent application system to file a provisional as soon as you have an idea of what you think it is. And then six months down the road, let's say you add another feature, you come up with another use case, you can update that provisional and capture that additional information. Now there's a caveat, that additional information gets the new filing date. In, in the United States and all countries, everything is based on what you disclose on what date. For example, this case was filed on, it was published on February 8th, uh, but it was filed, um, where's the filing date? It was filed October 13, 2017, okay? What I disclose on that date is what I'm entitled to claim. So anything else that I, you know, like since then I've already, I've already filed an update to this application because I've thought of other ideas. So now what I've done is I filed something called a continuation in part, which is basically an application that adds new material to it. That new material gets the new filing date. In other words, you can't, you know, part of the deal of a patent is you're fully disclosing your idea in exchange for excluding people from doing what you claim for 20 years. It's, it's a limited, it's a monopoly for a limited amount of time. So it wouldn't be very fair to the public if you say, hey, I'm disclosing this, and then one year later you update it, you keep, up, keep updating it, it would create a moving target for the public. So in all countries, everything is based on what you disclose on what date, and that's the only thing you can protect going forward from that date. Uh, so in your situation, you, you, know, you would follow the first case as soon as possible, but if you have uh, a, a, a new feature or an improvement or something, you would follow an updated application, uh, hopefully a provisional. If you, you know, if you're doing the, the strategy of filing provisionals, if not, like I didn't file provisionals, why well, I, I filed a provisional, but then later on I filed regular cases. You know, th this last invention that I filed occurred to me two years after you know I filed this other case, so it has to be filed as a whole brand new case, and everything that I did before. Uh, can actually become prior art against me. So uh, when you when you file an original case and you file a later case with some other stuff, it has to be novel also. In other words, uh, you know, every application you file has to have some novelty in it. Um, and that may have been confusing. <laughs> I apologize. But the bottom line is you can file a series of cases, either provisionals or uh, CIPs, which we can cover later. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. So, uh, let's see here. So yeah, once you get the drawings done uh, and approved, uh, the next step is to go through and just methodically describe them. And what I like to do is I start with, you know, the reason I told you guys that I like to put my drawings in the order that I want to describe them is because it makes it very efficient that way. You've got, you've got figure one with all the element 100s, figure two with all the element 200s, etc. And then you turn around and you start describing the figures. So for example, now we're getting to the, the, the and, and something that I need to mention, the, the drawings and the description is 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration. And what I mean by that, it's just a lot of hard work. You know, it's, it's putting the drawings in the right format and meticulously describing them. The claims, which is the last part we're going to talk about, you know, there's the drawings, there's, there's a description of the drawings, and then there's the claims. I treat those three things as three separate objects. And I like to do the drawings first, 
to make sure that I understand the drawings and that I think you've done a good job describing the drawings. After that, I'm going to have you describe the drawings, and then we're going to make sure that you're happy with it. We're both happy with the drawings and the description of the drawings. And then finally, the last thing we're going to cover is going to be the claims. Now, uh, I think a famous Supreme Court case said, the claim is the name of the game, okay? Uh, a lot of people, you know, on, on the internet or whatever say, this guy got a patent, you know, I'm afraid I can't do this. And I look at him, I go, well, have you looked at the claims? The claims are what determines what is being protected by the patent. And, and I'm going to cover the description next, uh, next, but after that I'll cover the claims. So there's the drawings, the description of drawings, and the claims. And the claims, on the other hand, are 10% perspiration and 90% inspiration. It's the total opposite. So in the claims, you're actually trying to, you're more creative. You're trying to figure out how to actually claim it, whereas the drawings and the description are kind of very methodical. You know, you draw it, you describe it, and you describe what you drew. So let's, let's take a look at an example of the, the description now. So you can see there's a lot of drawings in here. Uh, and here we go, brief description of the drawings. So before you start the detailed description, you're going to have a one-sentence description of every single drawing. So the brief description of the drawings, you know, right there says, figure one is a top view diagram for illustrative system and methods for solar greenhouse aquaponics. Etc. Etc. So each each one of those is a one sentence description, high level, of every drawing uh, that you're going to be describing. And then what I do is I literally cut and paste those paragraphs, put them into the detailed description, and now describe each paragraph in detail. Because you have to describe everything that's in the drawings um, that's important. Now in software. And, and in other arts, uh, you want to put more detail in the parts that are novel, the parts that are your invention, and less detail in the things that are well known. And let me give you an example. Uh, software. Uh, back in the day, like in the late 80s, if you read patent applications from the 80s, they spent two pages describing the internet. You know, literally like several pages worth of description of what is the internet. Okay, now you draw a cloud because, you know, in other words, now people know what the Internet is. You don't have, so, so when you're describing a software application that uses the Internet, you don't have to explain to me how the Internet works. I want to know what the heck you're doing on the Internet. What is it that you're doing differently on the Internet or, you know, how are your structures different? So the point being is you're going to spend more time and more detail on the things that are new and novel and less time and less detail on the things that are well known. And part of the reason of the numbering system that I gave you guys before is if you've already described something in figure one and it shows up in figure two, you don't have to re-describe it. And that's the beauty of, of, of tracking your numbers through the whole entire thing. Because imagine how tedious it would be that every time some element shows up in another drawing you have to go back and re-describe it because you gave it a new number. So part of tracking the numbers through through the drawings is so that you don't have to go back and rewrite every single, you know, every time you talk about the widget 103, you know, on the next drawing it's 203, and the next drawing is 303. Now you're gonna have to describe it three different times when it's the exact same thing. So, like I said, you're gonna have a brief description of the drawings. And, and, and literally the bulk of the work, you know, the, the way you're going to save money with, with a patent attorney, generating drawings, generating description from the drawings, that's like 10% of the work, the grunt work. The final part is the claims. And the claims, the way, you know, uh, claim drafting is an art, you know, and, and it takes, you know, if, if writing drawings and description is like 101 level stuff, Claim drafting is like 501 or 601, just to give you an idea. It's a much higher level uh, um, skill. I teach people how to write claims, but typically with, with guys that are new uh, to writing patent applications, what I like to do is I like to tell you, look, I want you to tell me the minimal components from the drawings 
that you think makes your invention novel over the prior art. Now, this is important, the minimal components. Uh, if, you've, if you've ever heard of the minimal viable product, which is a sort of analogous situation is, you know, what's the minimal product that you can get to market that functions for your idea? You know, it's called the minimal viable product. A claim is sort of like that. It's like, what are the minimal components that make your idea novel over the prior art? Yes, sir. Uh, are you going to get to the point, the question is, how do we know what the prior art is? Well, that, that's a great question, you know, and it's a function of your skill. You know, I, I did work with guys from Hughes Network Systems. You know, they're, they're designing a high-definition video over set-top boxes. You know, they knew the prior art. Those guys are, you know, PhDs in, in, you know, communication systems. Those guys know what all their colleagues are doing, and it's all white papers. At that level, it's not patents. It's all white papers. So when I work with a guy like that, he's going to come to me, and he's going to say, Carlos, here's the prior art. And this is why we're different. And they're always going to be patentable. You know, when you're working with guys that are R&D, you know, it's super hard to understand, but very easy to patent. And that was covered in the previous webinar. But, you know, as things become very, very hard to understand, there's less people that, the, 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 the number of people that can understand it are much fewer, which means patentability is much higher. So when I'm working with guys from Hughes Network Systems, they don't search. You know, I'm not going to tell them to search because they're PhDs in communications. They're going to give me the white papers. Now let's talk about kitty litter boxes, which is an example from a previous webinar. You know, I, I my wife was pregnant, and I was I was I I thought I wanted to file a patent on a kitty litter box. Well, I found like thousands and thousands of patents in kitty litter box art. Now, you know. I wasn't an expert in the kitty litter box area, and as soon as I did a quick search, I said, I'm not going to waste my time filing here because there's so many frustrated husbands that are inventing kitty litter boxes. It's going to be a waste of my time. So it's, it's a function of your skill in the art. So as your skill in the art goes towards infinity, searching goes to zero. As your skill in the art goes to zero, like me in the kitty litter box, searching goes to infinity. You have to search it. So, uh, back to your question, you can search it. You can search Google, uh, you know, everything is online nowadays. Uh, all, all, the patent, um, all the patent offices have their databases online, searchable. Uh, there's services that let you search, you know, you can, Google patents lets you search. You know, so there's a lot of stuff you can do ahead of time to save yourself money and time. You know, because uh, I, had, I had a potential client call me and she said, I invented a vacuum cleaner for vacuuming dog poop. And I said, are you a vacuum cleaner engineer? And you know, I'm asking that. She said, no, I'm not. She, she, she was a housewife. I said, well, are you, she, are, you, are you sure that it's not out there? And she goes, well, I haven't seen it. And I literally got on Google and searched on vacuum cleaner for dog poop. And I got a shopping page with like machines that are for sale. You know, so, so there's a situation of somebody that, that, you know, if I was an unscrupulous patent attorney, I'd go, yeah, let's file this, you know, but, you know, that's not the way I operate. I'm going to tell you, search it, kick the tires, you know, let's, let's do as much as we can to avoid uh, potentially wasting a lot of money filing up something that maybe isn't patentable. Yes, sir. So how do you avoid, uh, I don't know the term for it, but basically uh, contaminating your knowledge base? So that's... Well, th you know, that's a good question. But see, th this is the problem is that, that in, in the United States, there is no duty to search. You can, you can file anything. You, you can say, yeah, I invented this, and you can file it, and you can see if it sticks. There's no duty to search. Once you search, you have a duty, well, whether you search or not, you have a duty in the United States to disclose all relevant prior art. So if you come to me, you know, and you say, hey, Carlos, I want to work on this, you know, dog poop vacuum cleaner, you know, and I know that there's dog poop vacuum cleaners on the market, I can't in good faith file a patent application for you. I have to, I, if I do, I'm committing fraud, uh, you know. So, so in other words, <clears throat> you and I, the attorney and the applicant, have a duty to disclose to the patent office 
<coughs> all relevant prior art, but you don't have a duty to search. But I will tell you why you want to search, because you don't want to waste your time and money. You know, I assume that you're trying to get a patent because you want to protect a business function. You know, uh, I can get patents if you just want to hang a patent on your wall. You know, there's, they're called vanity patents. You know, you want a patent, I can get you a patent you can hang on your wall. But I usually work with people that want patents because they want to make a business out of it. And in that situation, you want to find the best prior art. You want to get the best prior art in front of the examiner. You want to make sure the examiner does his best possible search. And then you want to convince the examiner and have him allow the case because if you follow all those steps, you're going to end up with a patent that's actually enforceable. And that's another part about patents. You've probably heard millions of people saying, how the heck did they patent that? Just because there's a patent doesn't mean it's valid. It has a presumption of validity, but it doesn't mean that it's valid. The examiner could have done a crappy job. You know, when, when I file a patent application and the examiner issues what's called a first office action allowance with no search, I'm scared. I'm like, you know, it's not supposed to be, you know, he didn't find anything. You know, I mean, I didn't invent the light bulb. So what I'm saying is, you know, that, that, it's, that, that you want to make sure that you do a good job, get the best art in there, and you get the examiner to do the best art. And if you can't follow patent, you can't follow patent. You know, then you don't waste your money. You've saved yourself money that way. You know, I, I had a, a potential client that had come up with uh, paint that could change, you know, um, could change depending on the lighting. You know, it was like sort of adaptive paint. And, you know, he was going to use it on aircraft. And, and we did a search, and sure enough, it, there wasn't exactly the application to aircraft, but there was applications for buildings and other things. And I said, look, we could probably get a really super detailed claim, but he was a business guy who said, no, I want to, I need something broader than that. He, he abandoned, he didn't go after that invention. And he saved himself potentially tens of thousands of dollars because he could have spent all that money trying to protect that industry. So if that invention of his that he was considering was essential to his business, uh, <laughs> would he be violating the prior patent probably and vulnerable as a result? That's an excellent question. Yes, uh, when, when you intentionally violate a patent, there's trouble damages, okay? So, so uh, you know, but this is part of the other lecture, but I'll cover it really quickly. You know, getting a patent and being able to practice a patent are two different things, two completely different things. Um, and I'll give you an example. I have a patent on a car with a car, or let's say a frame, an engine mounted the frame where the engine drives the wheels. Okay, I've described a car or a steam engine, you know, a lot of things can be covered under that claim. So if you build a frame with wheels and an engine that drives the wheels, you're infringing my patent. You can't build that. I can stop you from building that. I can say, hey, you're violating the claim of my patent. You have a frame, you have an engine, you have an engine that drives the wheels. Okay? Now, let's say you come up with anti-lock brakes. Okay? Not disclosed, you know, I didn't know about it. You can get a patent on annual lock brakes, okay? What that means is as soon as, I, so I have the patent on a car with four wheels, you have a patent on annual lock brakes. You can prevent me from putting anti lock brakes on my, on my car. Because I can build cars and I can stop you from building cars, but as soon as I build a car and put your annual lock brakes on it, now I'm violating your patent. And this is why you see common features in printers and phones and everything else. They, they cross-license their patents. Chevy will say, I'll license my anti-lock brake patent to Ford, and Ford says, I'll license my four-wheel patent to you, and both people go off and make cars. Um, I don't know if they answered your question. Right, but, but yeah, so, so the, the, a, a patent is the right to exclude. That's the important thing. It's the, the right to exclude others from doing what you claim. Whether you can practice it or not, that's called freedom, um, freedom to operate. And back to the car and the anti-lock brake example, you know, you may have gotten a patent on anti-lock brakes, but you can't build a car. Because as soon as you build a car, you're going to be violating my car patent. So let's see. Um, let's go into the mechanics of the drawings a little bit.
and like I said, these templates are all going to be available. Okay. So this is a make-believe system, and it just shows, you know, the examples that I was talking about. Figure 1, system 100, 102, 104, you know, there's a, there's a, a discriminator 102, a network 112, the internet perhaps, a server 104, a controller, a database, and an interface. So that's your figure 1, system 100. And then if you go to figure two, you notice that everything that, that was from the previous figure carries the previous number. But now, for example, this functionality was not described with respect to 106 before the interface. Now you're going to describe the elements that make up that interface, and they're all going to get a different number now. So that just short, sort of shows you know, the, the concept that I was talking about before. Um, this, this figure is important because it shows, you know, one of the problems you're going to get into, especially with gigantic software and hardware systems, is we're going to get to this, but you have a very limited amount of space to put your drawings in. Uh, it's A4 paper with one-inch margins, roughly, which gives you, like, this much space to work with. And it has to be 12-point aerial font, and it has to be black and white line drawings. Well, if you have a gigantic 50-page flowchart, there's no way you're going to be able to fit it inside of, of those margins. And this works whether you're doing hardware or software. It doesn't matter. This is how you break up a complex flowchart. You know, this thing actually goes on for another page. And the way you show that is you put a little bubble with an A, a little bubble with a B, and that shows where it connects to the other component. So, for example, if we're going to combine figure 8A and 8B, this A would be connected to that A, and that B would be connected to that B. And that's how you can break up hardware or software. You know, like if my greenhouse had multiple components, I could have done that even in my greenhouse. I could have drawn a dashed line and put an A, B, C, and on another page I could have drawn what's connected uh, to the rest of the drawing. So this is very helpful if you have very complex drawings that, that, that normally won't fit in the margins. And these are the margins. So you're talking about A4 paper, and you're talking about an inch on the top and left, and about 0.7 on the, on the right and bottom. Uh, and the interesting thing is even for, for landscape, the margins are, are still the same because what happens is you notice how up here there's the, the two of two. When you actually, and, and that's why when you saw that patent application, the, the pages were flipped sideways because the patent office wants you to have everything sort of be able to stack up on each other, whether it's portrait or landscape. Yeah, you notice that th th this is 1.1 and that's 1.1, and there's two of two over here. That's because when you flip it over, it's going to line up with this one of two. Of course, now the drawing is going to be sideways, but that's the way the patent office wants you to do the drawings. Okay. So let's talk about the claims. Let me go back to mine. Okay, so we, we mentioned earlier that the published application is going to have a descriptive figure. And this application was directed to a very specific component within the entire system. And this is something that's interesting about a patent application is, you know, think of a car. You know, you could write a patent application on a car, and the car could have a GPS system, it could have an anti-like brake system, it could have a driverless vehicle system, it could have a heating system, 
all those systems and subsystems could all be part of something that we call a patent application for a car. And now you could go and file claims just to the GPS, just to the anti-lock brakes. So for example, you know, in, in my system, you know, there's a lot of components. And right, and this particular patent is directed to one specific component, the hard filter right here. So after I got patents covering some of the other components, now I went back and I'm getting a patent covering this specific filter configuration. And, you know, writing claims is tricky, but the way, the way I teach uh, people how to sort of make my job easier is you're going you're gonna to point to the drawings and you're going to say, Carlos, now, of course, you need to know what's novel. And, you know, somebody, you asked a question earlier, how do I know if it's novel? Well, you've searched it. Okay, you've searched it and now you know, as far as, you know, you, in good faith, you know that it's not out there. Now the next step is you want to claim it and you want to claim the minimal components. And this is something that's a little different than it's counterintuitive. You would think that the claim would have to describe every single component, but no, it doesn't because the claim is the minimal thing somebody has to do to infringe your patent. For example, let's go back to the car example, okay? A car is very complex, you know, and, and, and I claimed it very broadly. A frame, wheels attached to the frame, an engine mounted on the frame where the engine drives the wheels. You know, that's a very broad way of claiming a car and it could cover, I didn't say how many wheels, did I? I, I you know, you, you could say it drives a wheel. As long, you know, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to prevent somebody, you know, for example, in that claim, I might want to prevent somebody that makes a trike. Right? You've seen the cars with two wheels in the back and one in the front, right? You know, I might claim it as, as you know, at least two wheels attached to a frame. At least two wheels attached to a frame. You know, an engine that drives at least those two wheels. Now that's going to cover a car or a trike or a train. <laughs> you know, because I haven't said what kind of engine, you know. So so the point being is, you know, you're, you're, the claim... The reason the claim is 90% inspiration and 10% perspiration is because that's when you're, you're trying to be creative and you're trying to think of how can I claim this as broadly as possible that I can in good faith. Right now, I can't write a claim for a frame, an engine that drives a frame and, and wheels because that reads on cars and trains and stuff that's already been invented. Right now, I would have to describe a new type, not even anti-lock brakes, a new type of anti lock brakes that's never been invented. So the point being is the level of detail of the claim has to be commensurate with what's in the prior art. Right now, I can't claim a car with four wheels because it's been invented this early. So I'm jumping that off. Yeah. The 20 year thing, right? Yeah. So that means that anything that's typically that's been invented, you know, you know, over the 20 years, you can do it, right? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, the way patent system works is you get a monopoly for a limited amount of time, the right to exclude others from practicing your invention in exchange for fully disclosing your invention so that people can make it because after your patent expires, it enters the public domain. Every single day, patents are expiring. You know, today, I don't know how many patents expired. You can practice every one of those patents. You can go to the patent office and, or, the, or Google patents and you can search expired patents. Every single expired patent is now in the public domain. And that's how the patent system is supposed to help technologies because it allows little companies to, to create a little monopoly and practice, you know, to exclude others from doing what they're doing so they can make some money off of it. But then after that monopoly, which, you know, depending on whether you're a software or a medical guy, you know, the, the medical people think the patent term is too short because of the, you know, the FDA requirements. Drugs, yeah, the, 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 the drug companies want to extend the patent term because they're using they're using the very very end of the twenty year term. Software companies want to shorten the patent term because they're using maybe you know first five years of it, if that you know. Which is another example is when you file, when don't you file? You know, a lot of it is shelf life. 
you know, if you come up with something that you know is only going to be around a year, why would you waste your time filing a patent on it? You know, you want to file on something that you know is going to be, you know, is going to have some shelf life to it. Um, So let's go to the claim on this guy here. And actually, this claim got allowed. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I've, I've intentionally done something here that's, um, let's see here. Um, you know, the, the system that I designed is a tiny solar greenhouse that's fully air powered. And, the strategy that I'm taking right now, which actually works uh, pretty well with startups as well, is I always try to get the system level patents as quickly as possible. And by system level is, is you know, if you look at this claim, I'm claim, you know, I told you I'm going after just the filter, but it's much easier for me to get the patent allowed quickly by claiming the whole entire structure. And once I have the whole entire structure patented, later on I can go back and go after just the filter. So it's a strategy that I use. You know, I, I'd rather I'd rather get the patents as quickly as possible and, and build up the portfolio as quickly as possible, and then go back and go after the, each individual component. For example, let's look at this one. This is I told you is the filter, and let's take a quick look at the filter so you'll see how I claimed it. Um, this filter actually came out of necessity because, and I'll, I'll talk about water filters real quick. You know, when you're doing filter filters for fish tanks, typically you have three stages. You have some sort of mechanical filtration, and then you have some sort of, um, uh, well, to actually you have some sort of settling, which is really just where you just let the water kind of settle slowly. Then you have some mechanical filtration, which may be, you know, these plastic type filters. And then finally you have biological filtration, which typically involves air and some sort of media that's moving around. So the traditional filters were made up of three separate stages. Well, I didn't have enough room in my greenhouse for three, you know, three separate filters. So I started thinking, well, how can I make one filter that does everything? And that's where I came up with this idea. And basically, it's, it's a filter that, that water comes in from the fish tank here, and it gets pushed into this tube here. And what that does is it forces the solids to fall through the bottom, and then they're going to get caught in the bottom, and I can drain them out through the bottom. Well, any solids that, that you know, so, so basically they have no way of getting in here. They have to go through this thing called a stilling well. And it goes through the stilling well, and now they're going to settle down here, and they're going to get drained through the top. Whatever solids do make it back up have to go through multiple layers of mechanical filters. So th this is like a super coarse filter all the way to a super fine filter. So now the, the, the fish poop water is going to be filtering up through here because, you know, it's filling up, and it's coming back up. It's coming down through here and then back up through these filters. And now on top of this very top filter, I have an air stone. An air stone is a porous rock, basically, that you pump air into it that put, puts bubbles out. And this is where I do my biological filtration. So after the, after the water comes all the way through here, this air stone is now agitating the water. And in here, I grow uh, something called duckweed and algae. And that, that creates another level of filtering. And then finally, I have a sponge filter that's wrapped around that here. And then the water comes out through that sponge filter and goes back to the fish tank. Now, this was out of necessity. And they say, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. I didn't have room for three separate trash cans, so I combined it in, in a way that, that was novel. And the other thing that I did, my the, the novelty of this system is it's completely powered by air. There's no water pumps in my system. Everything is done with air. And in fact, in the actual system, the way the water gets pushed in here is using air. And what that does is it actually breaks up the fish poop, which is actually undesirable. In fact, that's how I got the patent allowed was, 
when I showed this to a lot of the quote fish tank experts, they're going, that's not a settling filter. You know, a settling filter just lets the solids just sort of real slow, like in a regular settling filter, the water wouldn't be wouldn't be forced here with air. It would actually just trickle in here really, really slowly, and the solids would just kind of fall to the bottom and then get collected and then slowly rise through the top. But since my system runs from air, I'm actually forcing the water with air through here, which is breaking up the solids. But since I have these multiple layers of filters, and since I have this additional layer of duckweed and algae, I don't really care because actually uh, the, the duckweed and the algae actually processes all those broken up effluents and actually turns out to be very advantageous because the algae can be used as fish food. And the interesting thing is, is you know, like when you do something like when you do something and the experts tell you that it can't be done and you figure it out, that's almost automatic patentability. And the reason for that is because if you're doing something, if everybody says, you can't do that. It's impossible to do that. And then you do it. You can you can show that to the patent office and say, look, you know, I went against all the advice of the experts and I got it to work. And that'll and, and that's how this particular case got allowed. So, you know, I could have claimed this in super amount of detail, but let's go to the claim now. And I just want to show you how that thing works so that you can sort of understand the claim a little bit. Uh, Okay, now I mentioned that I claim it as a system, so there's the, the, you know, this part on the top is very general. A solar greenhouse insulated northeast-south, a fish tank housed within the greenhouse, a plurality of grow beds coupled to the fish tank, a hard filter. So now, you know, this claim right here, this is the anti-lock brakes right here. You know, right here I'm claiming a car with four wheels. And now here's the anti-lock brakes. I'm going into the details of that specific component. So what I've done is I've claimed all the other stuff very generally. As long as you provide a solar greenhouse and a fish tank and grow beds and, and a hard filter, you know, as long as you provide that stuff and your hard filter does this as well, then you're going to be violating this particular claim of this patent. And you notice now I'm getting into the details. And I claimed it as broadly as I could. Uh, a hard filter coupled to the fish tank through a hard filter geyser pump. Now this was important because I told you guys before that everybody does it by just letting the water come in. I'm actually forcing it in with this thing called the geyser pump. So this was something that was distinguishing from the prior art, the fact that I'm using a geyser pump to bring the water into the hard filter. The stilling well receiving water from the fish tank pumped by the hard filter geyser pump. So now I've, I've described how the, you know, the next part of it is the geyser pump pumps the water in, it goes into the stilling well. A plurality of filter media sections of varying coarseness for providing mechanical filtration disposed around the stilling well, including a coarse media section uh, near, let's go over here. near the bottom of the solids collection chamber and a finer media section near the top of the solids collection chamber. One or more air stones disposed on top of, of the media section. Aquatic plants including algae and duckweed for providing biological filtration and growing on the water surface over the air stones and a sponge filter to capture the overflow. So now what does that mean? That means that in order to infringe that claim, you have to make a solar greenhouse that has fish tanks, water pump, and you have to have a filter with the configuration that I designed. And, you know, that's, I may have, you know, and this is, you know, this is part of strategy, you know. That claim may actually be more narrow than what I'm entitled, but I would rather get a patent right now as fast as possible than to sit there and argue with the examiner and, and fight with them over trying to get super broad claim. Because once he allows a patent, it's much easier for him to allow patent number two. So in other words, I'm going to go back with every single one of these patents and I'm going to refile them and I'm going to start deleting things. I'm going to get rid of the greenhouse. You know, I'm, in other words, 
I'm going to go back to the examiner. I'm going to say, let's get rid of everything that's not needed here for you to still allow this claim. And now the examiner, since he's worked with you, he trusts you, he's going to work with you to actually get you broader claims. Whereas if you actually went in for those broad claims at the very beginning, you could be fighting back and forth with the patent office for a long time. So the strategy I typically take is I'll, I'll try to get the patent as fast as possible on something that still has a business purpose. That claim, you know, if you look at the claim, you know, I didn't mention whether the stilling well is vertical or horizontal. You know, it still has some breadth to it. I didn't specifically specify a stilling well that's oriented from top to bottom. You know, in other words, you know, that particular claim could cover a lot of different configurations of that same filter. And that's the, you know, that's how patents work is they, they protect the high level functionality so that somebody can't change one little tiny thing. Like somebody won't be able to go here and say, well, I'm just going to put my stilling well sideways. You know, because, you know, the beauty of the claim is if you claim it at a high level functionally, like, like back to the claim of, you know, a frame with an a engine and an engine that drives the wheels, you know, that's such a broad claim. It could cover a lot of different, different configurations. But as far as what I would need from you, uh, you know, in other words, you're not going to be writing claims like this right off, you know, right off of the top of your head. But... You might say, Carlos, I want I want to go after the, the filter in figure five or whatever. And out of those things, you know, out of that particular filter, these are the parts that are important. Sort of like in your idea, you know, you might want to point out just the little the minimal things that you think allow the functionality, and that's probably what we want to claim. Um, and this has gone a lot faster than I expected. Because we still have a whole nother hour. You guys want to take a break or questions or break? Yes, sir. Uh, I had a question about you were talking about talking to experts about this. Say again? You were talking about uh, discussing this with experts or other folks before you file, right? Examiners. Uh, you had said experts. Oh, 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 oh. Um, you mean when I was talking about like the guy doing the satellite communication system? No, I was talking about the filter. You were saying experts said it couldn't be done. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. So, is, what's the what's your protection in that case? What keeps them from taking your thing and filing first? Well, first of all, you know. Very close. Does that constitute prior art at that point? Excuse me. Does that disclosure to the exports? Well, uh, constitute okay. prior art. First of all, I don't. You know, I typically don't talk. To, well, the U.S. gives you one year to file. In the United States, you have one year to file a patent application after making a public disclosure. There is an experimental use exception. In other words, if you're actually experimenting, you can you can claim that. Uh, but in these situations, I don't disclose it at all until the patent's already been filed. So, for example, I had you know the last patent that I did, you know, I had some different embodiments. I would not show them on Facebook. I would not discuss them with anybody until I filed the patent. And that's you know that that's a good point. But you know, since my system was air powered and I knew how conventional, uh, you know, how conventional filters worked, I knew what the experts were already recommending. Like, for example, with aquaponics, the experts always say you only have one water pump, you know. So after I filed my patent application and they saw all these air pumps, they're going, well, you're violating the golden rule of having one water pump, you know. And you're using more energy than we are, and they're correct. You know, my system uses more energy than having a single water pump. However, a single water pump is a single point of failure. So I traded off, you know, redundancy for efficiency. And, and by doing that, I was able to get a patent covering a fully air-powered system. Uh, and as it turns out, it's actually beneficial for off-grid. You know, we're doing a project perhaps in Jordan, you know, and the nice thing about having uh, each component being like its own little module powered by its own little air pump is that each one could have its own little solar panel with no battery. So even though the system itself uses more energy than using a single water pump, in a situation like off-grid, it's actually more beneficial. And in fact, the, the, the components in the system, you know, the modularized uh, grow beds, 
You can actually pop them into ponds. You know, you could take this grow bed with this geyser pump and a, and a solar panel and pop it into an existing river or an existing pond because it's like its own little self-contained module. But, uh, but you know, good point. Uh, the, you know, the United States has this one-year grace period. The rest of the world has something called absolute novelty. And that means as soon as you disclose something, you've given it away. So, for example, uh, even though I had one year to file stuff that I've disclosed in the United States, I've already given it away to the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world has absolute novelty in this search. So is there any accepted way to get things away from the rest of the world? Well, yeah, white papers. I mean, there's, there's no such thing as accepted. I mean, you know, you you have to make... So, like, for instance, like, intentionally getting something injected into a court case. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there's... A, a, right now, you can submit prior art. You, you know, you can you third parties can submit prior art uh, in in an ongoing prosecution case. Uh, if if you know of a patent that's worrisome, you could call up the the, the attorney and, and send him art. And I told you earlier that, that they have a duty to disclose. In other words, uh, if, if you send me art on any of my inventions, I have to disclose in the patent office. Same thing with any other patent attorney or any applicant. Uh, so yes, there is ways to inject prior art into the system. In fact, Google, if you go to Google Patents, there's a prior art button that it parses your patent and, 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 and generates like things that are similar, <laughs> interestingly enough. Yeah, so, so you know, there's, uh, they're, they're actually called third party requests where uh, you can actually, you know, you can actually come to me and say, hey, Carlos, I want you to file this prior art in this guy's patent application. And I can go in and file it, and it's going to go in front of the patent office, and now it has to be considered. And again, you know, I don't consider that a bad thing, because actually, you know, the worst thing is getting a patent and then trying to use it and then finding out that you have nothing. You know, after spending all that money, you know, maybe developing the product and the patent and whatever, just to find out that you have, you know, an invalid patent. So. Uh, I'm all for getting the best prior art, you know, and, and making sure that everybody does their best possible job. Uh, I used to get really worried when, you know, uh, the examiners had good prior art. I'd be, like, depressed. Be, oh, my God, the examiners have good art. And this one partner came up to me and said, we get clients patents that they deserve. You know, if you don't deserve a patent, you don't deserve a patent. If you submit your patent to the prior art search yeah. function, does that count as disclosure? Yes. If you submit it, you, if you knew yourself, yeah. any prior art that you become aware of, you have a duty to disclose. That's not what no, he's saying. If your information enters the system, is that disclosure? Uh, if your information, sorry, well, if these are all published applications. What do you mean? If I search for prior art using the technique you just described, am I disclosing? I have to search Google only has published applications. So no, no, let's say you invent something yeah. and you plug it in to see if there is prior art. Is you plugging that in to search disclosing your invention? Let's say it doesn't exist, but Google now has that in their search box, right? Or something. So I can't remember specifically, but I've seen it somewhere that's not pretty sure that that's what it's like. So, like, for instance, like, say there's a search site and they list the most recent searches, that would definitely count. Yeah, but I mean, you know, typically when you're doing searches, you're searching at sort of a pretty high level, you know, which is really not patentable at that level. So, so yeah, if you, if you enter, you know, like, you know, an exact description of your invention, perhaps, you know, and, and, it, and it gets put somewhere, I mean, for example, you know, I was a patent examiner. We would go through the newspaper and we would cut out pictures. I was doing uh, uh, speech signal processing, you know, and people would file inventions for like, oh, I've got a talking keychain or something like that. We actually would go in the newspaper and cut out like, you know, talking keychain, you know, nine ninety nine, and we copy it out of the paper, date stamp it, and stick it in the file. Now it's all digitized. So that when somebody comes in and says, "Hey, I invented this," we can show them that. So yes, there, it has you know it has to be in the public domain, 
and it has to be accessible in the public domain. So, uh, you know, if you could, you know, if there's sites that list Google searches, which I've seen that, like, does Google do it or? So, like, as an example of one point, Yahoo released a whole bunch of searches that were in and all the names or something like that. You couldn't tell who did the searches, but you could see the searches. Well, you know, prior, prior art is anything that's accessible to the public. Uh, a good example is a, a master's thesis that's only available at the library in the school, and you physically have to go to the library and get a card and then pull, you know, pull the thesis out. That's still prior art because it's still accessible. Um, in the United States, it has to be accessible to the public, and it has to be prior art, which means you have to have a way of date stamping it or something. For example, we use the Wayback Machine, you know, in court cases. Where we're trying to prove, you know, what was in the prior art, what somebody did at a certain time, what they disclosed. Um, you know, we might use the Wayback Machine, and and for a while they weren't admitting that, but now there's way of there's ways of actually validating that kind of stuff. But the bottom line, it has to be able to be validated as prior art. There has to be a way of determining the date that it was disclosed. So yes, a very detailed search on an invention, if you have a way of validating it, could potentially be used as prior art. I mean, you know, uh, but like I said, typically when I'm searching stuff, it's like, you know, kitty litter bot, you know, at super high level just to see what's out there. Um, so, like, there's an example of a search I did a long time ago, and I know the name of thing was exoskeletal pain. It's basically like exoskeletal pain. Yeah. So, like, I think Google search was probably like almost 20 years ago at this point, but basically body armor that. Yeah, but, but look, even exoskeletal pain, you know, it's too broad. You know, you, you know, you can't get you can't get inventions patented on super broad concepts because they prevent all applications of them. A good example was the the guy that invented the um, the telegraph. He was trying to get a, and it's a famous case. He was trying to get a claim that covered. The use of electromagnetic signals for communications. You know, that would have preempted every possible use of electronics on, on stuff that he didn't even anticipate. So something like exoskeletal pain uh, is too broad. You know, it, it's not, you know, now if you started talking about, you know, exoskeletal pain using a piezoelectric sensor coupled to, you know, uh, what, you know, some more detail like. Yeah, some, some specific implication there. Yes. So, like yeah. a TV or something, right? Or, or like a remote um, video recorder or something, a remote camera or something that goes over the internet. Something like that has been around forever. Yeah. Anybody can just make one of those and sell it themselves uh, and not be violating the patent. Yeah, if, if stuff is in, you know, anything that's in the public domain, you can make. Uh, a good example is IBM, um, you know, and, and, you know, since we've got time, maybe we can cover some of the other stuff. Um, have you guys heard of the IBM tech briefs? Yes. Are you? Yeah. And, you know, I, I always used to think that they're, like, open source or something that, you um, This is, you know, this is the IBM model right here. And I, I told you guys you're going to get a break, and I didn't give you a break. I apologize. Are you guys good? Or? I think everyone that wanted to take a break. What's that? I think everyone that wanted to take a break. Okay. You know, th this is the IBM model, basically. And, and I use IBM because they, they're sort of, quote, the gold standard in patents. I think they're company statement is to have more patents than any company on earth. I, I haven't verified, but I'm pretty sure that is their company statement. They want to have more patents than any other company on earth, and they do. Every year, IBM has more patents than any other company on earth. And, th you know, they're a machine. I've done work for them at, at various law firms, and literally they have an IP review team, 
and you know they have some sort of incentives for people to submit ideas and the IP review team is made up of business people and probably engineers and out of that whole process comes out three decisions typically they either patent publish or keep secret those three things uh, and, and this is why, you know, this is, you know, if you don't have the money to patent, you know, you should at least have some sort of model to prevent others from patenting it, or at least if you want to do it, from preventing you from doing it. So, for example, let's say IBM or, or Hughes Aircraft is a good example. Uh, when I was working at Hughes Aircraft, they had an invention disclosure system where if you submitted an invention disclosure and it got accepted for consideration, you know, it went into that black box, you got a thousand bucks just for being considered. And then out of that black box comes a decision whether they're going to patent it or not. If they patent it, you get like another thousand bucks. And if the patent gets granted, you get like a, a dinner and a medal and another thousand bucks. But the bottom line is they had an incentive to get people to submit ideas and they had a review team that would determine this right here is, is the NASA tech brief or the IBM tech brief. Uh, the reason IBM creates these tech briefs, it's stuff that they don't want to build right now, perhaps. It's not within their business scope, but they may want to do it later on. And they don't want somebody else to get a patent on it in case they want to do it later on. Now, once you, you give it away, you're going to be competing with everybody. So, for example, uh, if, I, if I write a tech brief and I publish it on the Internet, I have given it to the whole entire world. Anybody can build it, which means now you're going to have to compete on market. You know, when, when you, it's the same, the open source model is a good example. You know, when you, when you put stuff out open source, you're saying, look, I'm sharing this with everybody and I'm willing to compete with everybody else, you know, in the market and, you know, may the best man win. You know, part of the problem, you know, the problem with, with that methodology is that when you go against somebody that's highly well funded, like a Google, you don't stand a chance. And, and the example I use is uh, San Francisco was getting contracts for wiring, for providing wireless service in San Francisco. Google said free, you know, how do you compete with free if you're a little tiny startup? You know, so, so you know, a lot of the people I talk to talk about getting rid of the patent system, and, and the interesting thing, the people that talk about it the most are the little inventors and startups who say, we don't want patents. But, you know, just from my own experience, it's like, it's already nearly impossible for you to succeed. And even with a patent, it's nearly impossible for you to succeed. But at least you have the possibility of maybe defending it or maybe monetizing it. Once you give it away, you're entering the market, you know, and you're going to be competing against Google's and they're going to issue stuff for free and they're going to crush you. So, you know, as, as bad as patents are, as you think they are, they're the only chance that you have really as a small company. And really the people that want to get rid of the patents are actually the larger corporations because they actually can compete on market. You know, Google is so well funded, they don't really need patents. They, they could go into print, they could buy companies, they can do whatever the heck, heck they want. You know, they would be perfectly happy in a system where it's just based on pure competition. Uh, the, the patent system is about the only way that you might have a chance. So what do you think that MySpace having patents? I mean, generally speaking, I don't think patents actually, I, yeah, I mean, I don't have a really strong argument. I mean, the argument for patents is that if you have a patent and you're raising money, you're more likely to get money. But that doesn't actually relate to your success. And then, like even the aquaponics, like I was working with this startup like two years ago. They got tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. I don't think that they they built a system. I don't think they ever got any. And this was money from like pretty much the best known accelerator. Yeah. So like. Well, I mean, I you know all I can give you is is you know uh, good stories and bad stories. You know, I I could tell you that ninety nine point nine nine percent of the little startups don't make it. Right. You know, well, no, actually, but I can tell you the ones the ones that have made it, you know, that, that have real technology, the way they made it was by actually building a patent portfolio. And that's something that I cover in the other lecture, you know, like one patent is worthless. You know, you, you go to anybody with one patent, you're dead. 
you know, you need a portfolio of patents, and, and without a portfolio, you really have nothing. Uh, once you have a portfolio, uh, it's actually something, you know, I don't know if you've heard of patent trolls, but the patent trolls have figured out how to work the patent system. And, and you know, they, they make money off of patents because they figured out how to work the system. But the interesting thing is the way that they're working the system is actually the way that startups could also protect their stuff. And I'll give you an example. You know, uh, uh, you know, a patent troll knows that if he goes to Google with one patent and says, hey, Google, will you license my patent for $10 million? Uh, Google knows they can invalidate the patent for $500,000. And they're going to say, yeah, we're really interested. And the next thing you know, Google's going to be making what you're making, and you're going to be in court, and they're going to crush you. Now, if you go to Google with 100 patents, and it costs five hundred thousand dollars per patent to invalidate, and you're only asking for a percentage of that number. They're going to pay the fee, and you know, from my own experience, and you know, everything that I teach is not out of a book; it's from real life. You know, uh, I, I had a startup. The guy was from MIT. He was on his third startup. Uh, first two failed. Uh, he invented. Uh, I don't know if you guys played Ghost Recon. Um, he invented, uh, Ghost Recon came out, out with this game called Advanced Warfighter. And Ghost Recon was always based on realism, you know, real guns, first person shooter. And, they, and the trailer for Ghost Recon showed the ghosts walking through Mexico City because a cartel had taken over the city. And the dudes are looking around with these Google glasses. And everywhere they look, they see a red triangle or a green triangle, even in buildings. And I saw that, I go, I go, that's real technology, because you know, I knew that Ghost Recon was based on either real technology or technology that was coming forward. So sure enough, I found the Future Force Warrior program, which is an actual military program for the nano suits that you're talking about. Uh, and sure enough, I found a company called Soldier Vision that had written the software that identifies the good guys and the bad guys. This guy was out of MIT. And it was using satellite imagery and GPS and everything to figure out exactly. Well, of course, it had you know it had green, uh, red, and blue, you know, or I guess question mark. And you know this guy had had you know I found the dude. I found the guy. He was a 23 year old kid. And I said, hey, you know I saw your software on Ghost Recon. You need to know it was featured in the software because you know you I guess you don't have to license it because it's a video game. But anyways. I said, hey, I saw your software feature in Ghost Recon. I'm ex-military. If you ever, I'd be honored to work on your stuff. And you know, you never get work like that. But we corresponded for a few months, and then, like, uh, uh, about three or four months later, he said, hey, I got this office action on the friend of identification. Would you go talk to the examiner? So I go to the examiner, and this guy was brilliant. I mean, I, I, the reason I like working with cutting edge companies, getting the patents is easy. You know, it's easy to get the patents. Getting the money, you know, I don't know if you saw that picture of that meetup where I, I show the patent, you know, I show an iceberg and I show the patent at the very tip of the iceberg and then business and marketing on the bottom. You know, you know, getting the patents is easy, making money off of it, that's the tricky part. But this guy was pretty savvy, so so we get the patent on the friend or foe identification. And then typically, you know, we would develop a portfolio around that. We start claiming it from different angles and try to build up the portfolio. And after his third patent, he goes, uh, I don't want any more patents in this. He started doing ground, ground guidance. How do you route a soldier from point A to point B, whether he's in a Humvee or a, a, a bike or whatever on horseback, taking into account what the soldier can see and who can see the soldier. It's called intervisibility. And this dude developed software that actually, you know, when snipers were setting up their, their, their first their first point or their high point, or whatever, and I'm not an expert in this, you probably tell me more. You know, when they're setting up these points, it would take them like weeks using topographical maps to set up where they're going to be. With his software, they took this task and narrowed it down to hours because his software could tell you on any point on the map what can you see and who can see you. So he started developing software on how do you guide soldiers through the battlefield. And, you know, I told him, I said, look, Randy, you know, you're, you need a lot of patents. One patent is nothing. Uh, I said, why don't you let me train your in-house guy? 
I, I said, you're hiring eight programmers a year. Uh, hire a programmer and let me train him on writing patents. And I trained him on basically what I'm training you guys on. So I trained his in-house guy and we were filing patents for around 1500 bucks. Now, all his competitors were filing patents for around ten to 20000 bucks. So for the same amount of money, he was getting about 10 times the number of patents. So, you know, he started getting uh, some patents in the U.S. And I use him as an example because he's one of the good stories. Uh, he didn't go overseas. He's stuck in the U.S. And the reason for that was because, uh, you know, all his business was in the United States. Is that coming from here? Oh, it's the shop. Okay. So... So, you know, he was up to about seven, eight patents in the U.S. Then he started getting a, a contract in the U.K., so he started getting some patents in the U.K. Uh, then he started getting some work in Germany, started getting some patents in Germany. And I think his portfolio was like, I don't know, eight U.S. patents and maybe seven or so foreign patents. But he was working with Garmin. He was working with the U.S. Army. You know, he had contracts with them already. And he was a smart kid. And one day I get the letter, which I hate and I love. I get, I get a letter from my gigantic corporation that said, hey, as you know, we purchased your client's company. Please transfer all your work to this other law firm. Now, why did they buy him? You know, what, you know, you know, the reason they bought him was because he had technology and he had a patent portfolio. And it was more advantageous for that gigantic corporation to buy him than it was to try to knock him out. And that's the exact same thing that the trolls do. You know, the trolls know that if they go to you with 100 patents and they know it's going to cost you $5.1 million to validate them and they're only asking for a million, you're going to give them the million bucks. But that same exact strategy of building a portfolio around your technology, I say, can get you bought by Google or can keep Google away. Now, if you don't do that, then you're just purely competing, you know, and, and in certain areas, it's not such a bad thing. Uh, video games, for example, you can put out a good video game with you know zero funding and be Angry Birds and you know capture the market or whatever. But try to build a sensor, you know, some hardware or something like that, and then try to fight off the Chinese knockoffs and try to fight off somebody like National Semiconductor, you'll get crushed. You know, so you know, I look at I look at intellectual property as an umbrella. And it has tools, you know, and you use the tools when you need them. Uh, you know, you, you have to know, for example, when, uh, you know, intellectual property is more than just patents. You know, you've got trade secrets, you've got trademarks, you've got copyrights. You know, if you're, if you're doing video games, something that's only going to be around for a year, you know, your only hope is market, you know, capturing the market and, 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 you know, trademarking and building the business that way. If you're building sensors that are easily knocked off by the Chinese uh, and you're trying to build a business around it, you better build a patent portfolio because otherwise you're just going to get crushed. Uh, but back, you know, uh, but yes, but, but even with that being said, you make a very good point. And this is the point right now is that, you know, Right now, we've sort of been trained. Uh, you know, you know. I talked about open source, and you might think that I'm anti-open source, but I'm not. Uh, I am. What I want, what I want to see is, I want to see a world where there's open collaboration, free for personal, educational, non-commercial use. What is that? That's the classic uh, open source license, right? However, I have a caveat. I want the people to protect their IP as a group and share their IP as a group because that is the only way you guys, and I'm talking about the little people, the startups, small vendors, and universities, it's the only way you're going to be able to leverage yourself against the corporations. And, you know, once you guys start forming teams, and that's, you know, that's sort of a whole other topic is, is uh, I've been trying to do something which... Uh, for the past seven years, which I call it OE812, and it's actually the concept of instead of us sitting here competing with each other, like, you know, I've got aquaponics, maybe you've got hydroponics, okay? And maybe your, your hydroponics is close to what I'm doing, and now we're both sitting here trying to grab this piece of the market, and, you know, we might be competing with each other, we might be suing each other, perhaps. You know, if instead we actually formed a team, 
and I shared my pants with you and you shared your pants with me, now what comes out of that could actually be better than the individual patents. And that's what I'm actually trying to do even with my own invention. You know, I, uh, my patents are free for personal, educational, not commercial use. I want people to build them. Uh, I'll help people build them. I want that to happen. What I don't want is I don't want Pentair or somebody like that copying it and building systems and not even sending me a thank you letter. So, you know, the reason I'm filing for patents is not because I want to stop people from building it. I just don't want corporations to come in and steal it and not even give me a pat on the back. And if we start forming teams and doing this kind of stuff, I think we could, you know, we could do great things together. This is an actual invention that was never patented. Um, and, you know, what I try to teach people also is to, you know, to think like an inventor and not think like an engineer. And an inventor and engineer are two completely different people. Uh, as an engineer, you want to build something, you want to hold it, you want to make it. Uh, as an inventor, you're actually, you know, if, you know, as an inventor, you have the luxury of knowing that this application is going to be good for 20 years. What that means is when you're thinking like an inventor, you're not thinking of like, what can I build at this moment, but where is the technology going? What is going to be around in the next 20 years? So, for example, this was, you know, uh, Hughes had the patent on something called the digital receiver. And a digital receiver is uh, a radio um, that tunes to stations digitally. It doesn't use, you know, typically when you're tuning to, to communication systems, it's based on analog. Well, Hughes had the patent on the concept of digitizing a gigantic chunk of spectrum and using a computer to tune to AM, FM, or cellular. So what they were doing is on the front end, they were taking AM, FM, and cellular, and just with a real simple multiplier, they were mixing it between 0 and 50 megahertz. So they might put AM here, FM there, cellular over here. And since Hughes Aircraft had the fastest A to D converters on Earth at that time, they were able to digitize that whole entire chunk of spectrum, and with a fast enough computer, they could tune to AM, FM, and cellular all at the same time. Now, when I was working at the lab, Hughes had the patent on the digital receiver. So this is something interesting. You know, even though they didn't have a way of building it at that time, they still got a patent on it, which is sort of counterintuitive because it could be built. In other words, they didn't have the exact implementation, but it could be built. So sure enough, you know, we're having a lunch meeting, and, and the guy that owns the patent says, hey, we've got this digital receiver. The problem is that computers aren't fast enough right now. We're talking Windows 2.0-ish, like 10 megabyte hard disks or something. At that time, I was working on digital signal processors, and specifically I was working on neural networks. And I was looking at, like, you know, how do you fully interconnect chips? You know, like, how do you, you know, a neural network is just like a bunch of processors that are all fully interconnected. And you, you give it input and you, you feed back the error and the thing trains itself. So I was looking at, you know, structures for, for doing neural networks. And when he held up that patent, I said, I, I, I drew this on a napkin. And I drew four, these are uh, quad core DSPs. At the time, it was Texas Instruments had the fastest DSPs on Earth at that time. And I literally sketched on a napkin these fully interconnected quad cores with a, uh, an array of field programmable gate arrays on the input, an array of field programmable gate arrays on the output. And I handed the napkin to the dude, and I said, hey, with this, you can do anything. And we built the very first software-defined radio. Now, we didn't know it was a software-defined radio because that term wasn't even invented yet. but the point, the point is, is that, you know, when I came up with this architecture, I thought it was nothing. I was an engineer. I said, I just stuck a couple of DSPs together. You know, this is nothing. But later on, after I went and became a patent attorney, I realized that I could have submitted this as a patent at Hughes Aircraft. Uh, so, you know, when you think like an engineer, you often sort of belittle your stuff. You're like, oh, this is nothing, you know, but it, it could actually be something that's beneficial. Uh, another example is I have a schematic 
for a digital answering machine. I was working in telephony back in the day, and and you know I was working on, on speech signal processing, compression, and and you know this is when machines use tape. You know, which I, anyways, I was thinking, well, you know, you could just replace the tape with the memory, but I did the math and I realized that at that point in time you could only store like 0.1 seconds worth of compressed speech. So thinking like an engineer, I'm like, I'm not going to patent this. I can't build it right now. You know, if I would have thought like an inventor, I would have realized that in 20 years, memories are going to increase in capacity. And within 20 years, there would be digital answering machines. And sure enough, you know, it, it came out. I went back and actually researched the digital answering machine. And I actually was one year late. Uh, it, even if I had filed my patent application the day that I had my schematic, uh, Toshiba or one of the Japanese companies one year earlier had filed a patent for a digital answering machine. Now what that told me was that, I, you know, it was a good invention. It just wasn't, you know, I wasn't fast enough. Uh, the kitty litter box is another good example. Uh, you know, my wife was pregnant, and you know, I'm sitting there cleaning out the litter box, and. I'm thinking there's got to be a better way, and we had bought this machine that had like a infrared detector that would detect the cat, you know, and, and then after the cat was out of there, it had these little motors, stepper motors that would come through and rake, um, you know, rake the litter box. But, you know, it started jamming, and I sent it back, and I'm sitting there going, you know, there's got to be a simpler way, and this is how all inventions come about. And sure enough, I thought, you know, all you really need is like a sifting mechanism, you know, something to sift. And I started coming up with some designs, but knowing what you asked earlier, you know, when do you search, when do you not search, knowing that I wasn't an expert in the kitty litter box, I knew that I had to search it. And sure enough, when I searched it, there was lots of stuff very, very close to my idea. And the very next week at PetSmart, I go in there, and there's my invention, patent pending, 20 bucks. And it's literally, I mean, it's pretty easy to knock off. It's literally... Three litter boxes, right? One of the litter boxes has holes in it. And you just stack them together. You, you know, you put the litter on top, and after the cat is done, you just sift it like that. It goes, you know, the clean litter goes into the second box. Now you've got, you know, the poop, you dump that into a trash can. And now you take the bottom box, which is empty, you stick the, the one with the holes in it there, and then dump the clean litter on top, and then stack the other one underneath. No moving parts, 20 bucks. It still works. And, you know, what that told me was that had I thought of that maybe two years earlier, I might have been the one selling them at PetSmart. But I think I pretty much covered everything. Um, so if you guys have any questions, or we can end. So when you are looking at a patent that's got a lot of prior art, let's take the kitty litter case. Yeah. Let's say you've got a, an angle on it, but it's not a simple one chain, but you've got a synthesis of two features that exist in the prior art, but you're synthesizing them together. Is that patentable? Well, you know, combinations can be patentable, but they have to be non-obvious. And non-obviousness is a very uh, subjective standard. Uh, the way examiners apply it, and, and actually the Japanese are sort of notorious for this. It, under Japanese patent law, you know, if you have a system that's made up of A, B, and C, all they have to do is find A, B, and C, and say it would be obvious to combine it. In other words, in Japan, as soon as they find the components, they just say, oh, you could combine it and make what you make. So, so Japanese prosecution is very, very difficult because typically the combination itself has to be novel. In other words, it's not enough just to have the elements. They have to be combined in some specific way to create some unintended result or some advantage. Uh, in the United States, it's not quite as bad, but obviousness is sort of thing that, you know, the way examiners do it, you know, the way examiners do it, they actually do it sort of backwards. Uh, something that an examiner is not supposed to do, they're not supposed to reconstruct your invention from hindsight. So, for example, if I combine things and I show it to you, 
after I've shown it to you, it's very easy for you to say, oh yeah, I could have taken that, that, and that and combined it. It's called hindsight. You know, doing something in hindsight is very easy because you've already seen it. You've already seen the combination. The way, the way it's supposed to work in U.S. patent law is if the examiner had these references in front of him, in other words, he doesn't have his, your invention. Examiners typically take your invention and work backwards. They say, oh, you've got an A, B, and a C. Here's an A, B, and a C. It would be obvious to combine A, B, and C. That's not the way it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work is if somebody of ordinary skill in the art had those references in front of them, the A, the B, and the C, would they arrive at your invention in a logical way? In other words, is it logical that they would arrive at what you did if you put those three references in front of them? That's the way it's supposed to work, but unfortunately, when you start getting into obviousness, and this happens a lot in software, you know, because, you know, typically you're combining components. It's a tough one because now you're sitting there, it's like, you're saying it's obvious, you know, they're saying it's obvious, you're saying it's not, and it's it's a subjective standard. Um, typically, for those sort of things, you need what's called indicia of non-obviousness. I mentioned one earlier, uh, doing something that the experts don't recommend. You know, when, when, you, when you do something that goes against the general recommendation of the experts, that's indicia of non-obviousness. Um, unexpected results. When you combine something and you get a result that's unexpected, that can also be an indicia of non-obviousness. In the aquaponics system, you know, I, I, I grew mushrooms. And, and, you know, people, you know, the experts were telling me you cannot grow mushrooms in a flood and drain grow bed. They said that there's too many contaminants, that the mycelium will get contaminated. And, you know, me not being an expert in mushrooms, I was like, well, I'll give it a shot. You know, what's, what's worst case scenario? It doesn't work. Well, sure enough, it worked perfectly. You know, the mushrooms grew very, very well. And my logic was, well, they kind of grow in nature. And there's a lot of contaminants in nature. So as long as I pick a really aggressive mushroom strain and, and do things properly, it will probably grow. And sure enough, they grew. And... There's a patent pending on that one as well. And, and then the experts were all like puzzled why it had worked. And then about three weeks later, I'm sitting there on Facebook, and some guy in, a, in one of the mushroom groups that I'm in posts a picture of an invention that he had 10 years ago. What he was doing is, you know, mushrooms need humidity uh, to develop the fruit. He was taking a bucket, putting salt in it, and pumping the saline solution through a humidifier so that now the humidity was saline. And salt is an antibacterial. So, so he was saying that, you know, he thought of this, and that's why his mushrooms were not contaminated. And as soon as I saw that, I realized why my system was working. My fish tank water is 1% to 2% saline. It's, it's got about two parts per thousand salinity. So when I was flooding my, my, my mushroom mycelium with, with salt water, I was killing off all the bacteria. Now, the interesting thing about a patent is you don't have to know how it works. You know, I filed a patent on the structure of a flood and drain grow bed that's growing, you know, that's flooding and draining the mushroom substrate and that, you know, is, is, is you know, the, the mushroom substrate is within the medium. And it worked, but I didn't know why it worked. You know, in other words, I didn't know the exact mechanism till I saw that guy's invention and saw that the salt water was, was actually keeping my mushrooms from getting contaminated. So, you know, the point being is that you can come up with something and not know the theory of operation, but as long as it works and you can describe it so that somebody can build it, you can get a patent on it. You do not have to know why something works as long as it works. And I think we've hit the whole entire, yeah, we've got 15 minutes to spare, but you guys didn't take a break, so any more questions or? Yeah, I mean, I've got questions. Yeah. Things, but, um, when you talk about portfolios, you yeah. have those portfolios instead of having one, are you saying that if you have, like your system, you said you like to start with the system first. Yeah. And you've got components A, B, and C. As far as that portfolio approach, wouldn't it be better to do the A, B, and C separately, or is it? Well, then, when you say portfolio, you mean inventing more stuff, which is obviously better. Well, well, you can't, you know, well, I've done both. Like the, the original patent had maybe 
you know, I've been adding drawings to my pattern as I come up with new stuff. Like the mushroom idea came later. You know, like I had a tiny solar air powered greenhouse. That was the first thing I did. And then later on, I started messing around with mushrooms and I realized that I could do mushrooms. So I followed the pattern on that. Recently, I realized that I could, I could do the greenhouse in a very specific way. Uh, you know, a, a problem with Chinese solar greenhouses, and this is again goes against the expert. The reason people don't use Chinese solar greenhouses, even though they're really awesome, uh, you've heard of Earthships probably. An Earthship is a Chinese solar greenhouse. It's got a big glazing on the south, you know, and it captures all that heat energy. But the reason people, commercial growers, aren't doing Chinese solar greenhouses is because you only have access to the south is the only part to get sun. So people usually do hoop houses for large scale commercial, you know, aquaponics and, and hydroponics because they want to get, you know, all that space. Well, you know, I realized that by growing mushrooms, the mushrooms happen to like the dark and they happen to like the cold. So I filed for a patent on a Chinese solar greenhouse where half is mushrooms on the north side and the other half is plants. So now I've solved the problem of, of you know, of, of Chinese solar greenhouses not being that great. Well, now that you're growing both mushrooms and plants, actually they're very advantageous because you can have the plants on one side of the greenhouse and the sunny side and on the dark side of the greenhouse behind the water wall, you know, the, the thermal battery, you know, every every uh, every passive solar design has a thermal sink in it, you know, a, a thermal battery water, you know. Uh, the Chinese used to take 55 gallon barrels and paint them black and put them in the in, inside North Wall. So all that solar energy gets collected in the barrels. Well, I figured out that if you if you make a wall, a black wall like that, right, to separate the sunny side from the dark side. You can have the mushrooms on the dark side on the colder end, and now you can have O2 CO2 exchange going in a circular fashion around in a circle. Now, the concept of growing mushrooms and plants is not new. There's a guy on Facebook that, you know, the, the big weed growers in Colorado, they've been doing gigantic weed grows on the top floor with, with mushrooms on the bottom floor and pumping all the CO2 up into the, uh, you know, up into the weed. Uh, because, you know, plants like CO2. So, you know, I can't get a claim on, you know, growing mushrooms next to plants and using the CO2 from the plants to pump, you know, because that's been done. However, my specific concept of a Chinese solar greenhouse with a water wall, you know, where the mushrooms are behind the water wall and the CO2 flows, you know, from, you know, naturally from the, you know, the top, top north through the south and back up, that could be patented. You know, the, the broad concept of, you know, mushrooms and, and plants probably isn't. So this is the base of that question. Is it better that you did those in two separate patents than one the first thing? Well, I, I had no choice because I hadn't even thought of, you know, this, this well, last see, thing. Let's say you had. See? Let's say you had. Well, it's money. See, the, the, you know, one of the things, you know, that corporations do, they'll file, well, let, let's look at the car, right? I said the car has anti-lock brakes, GPS, you know, lots of systems, right? You know, you as a little person, you can't file a thousand patents at once. You know, you don't have the money for it, you just can't do it. So when I work with the little people, we're forced to do what I do. I'm a little people also. I go after one invention. Before that, when issues, I go after another invention. So I get my patents, you know, serially in time. I build up my portfolio very, very slowly. A corporation files one invention a hundred different ways in a hundred different countries at the exact same time, you know, because they have the kind of money. So yes, that's the better approach, but you need the money. And, and not only that, but, but, you know, the laws are so screwed up. It's like, if you pay an extra $2,000 to the government, you can get a patent in six months. So like the little people, us, we wait five years to get a patent. Corporations are getting their patents in six months because they're paying an extra two thousand dollar government fee. So you know everything is stacked against us. You know everything, and this is part of the reason. You know, I keep going back to the sharing and you know joining teams. And if you're doing hydro and I'm doing aquaponics, maybe we should instead of competing with each other, I'm saying Mark, if we were, you know, maybe we should talk about actually collaborating instead of 
you know, competing with each other, you know, it's because of that. You know, it's because, you know, until we start forming groups, we're really not going to have uh, much power and we're going to be wiped so, out. After doing your first initial, initial search, yeah. if you think we have something that's patentable, contact you. And like, how would that work? How would that process work? Uh, with me, you know, everything's like a ping pong match. You know, I, I, it's part for efficiency. I treat, I, I treat it like a ping pong match. What I mean by that is, the ball is in somebody's court, but it's never in both courts at once. You know, so for example, and you know, I'm very low pressure. I mean, you know, all my work comes by word of mouth. You know, I don't do any advertising. It comes from referrals from friends or you know, from talking here or whatever. But I take it real slow, and part of it is really uh, you wanting to work with me. You know, you think that I'm going to do a good job, but you know, you expect me to be good at what I do, and you know, as a, as a patent attorney, that's expected. You know, you don't go to a patent attorney. You know, any patent attorney you go to better be good, right? Because you know that's the job. You're supposed to be good at it. But I try to distinguish myself on doing things like trying to minimize costs. You know, trying to do things that perhaps other firms aren't quite interested in. But typically the way it works is if, let's say you had an idea, you know, I would find out where you are on the curve. You know, are you the guy from Hughes Aircraft that's a Chinese PhD that, that you know, knows the prior art? In that case, I'm going to say, let's file it. You know, we don't even need to search it because you've already given me the best prior art. Are you the husband that invented a kitty litter box? Are you the lady that called me up and said, hey, I want to invent a vacuum cleaner that vacuums dog poop? You know. In other words, typically you decide what you want to do and then you contact me and if you want to work with me, we can take it step by step. It might be maybe searching it first, you know, maybe helping you learn how to search or teaching you how to search or whatever until you until you have a, a good idea that it's not out there. And then maybe even then you might say, hey, Carlos, why don't we have a professional search? You know, I, you know it, it, there's companies that do professional searching. There's companies that do nothing but search. There's people in India that do it for nothing. You know, there's like there's like Indian companies that do it for like hundred bucks or something. Uh, you have to be careful when you use foreign companies because you're exporting ideas out, and you cannot you can get in trouble a couple of ways, uh, including with the government. Like it's something that's like military, you know, by disclosing it. So, anyways, there's some issues with sending it outside. But you could search it yourself and sort of get a warm and fuzzy feeling. And after that, depending on how comfortable you feel, you might say, hey, let's have a professional search. Or if it's something that you're an expert in, you might say, hey, Carlos, I know this isn't out there. Let's file it. You know? uh, Danette's a good example. He's, you know, he's been working on something, and he's read every single patent in that area. You know, he literally is an expert in, in that patent area. He knows the patents better than I do. You know, so he, he's going to have a better idea than me of what, you know, what he wants to go after. But yeah, let's say you want to work with me. It's very simple. You know, uh, under Virginia law, I have to send you an engagement letter. Uh, and once you have the engagement letter, uh, you know, after you're done with this meeting, you're going to have the samples and templates, which is what I send anyways. And, and literally, every person I work with kind of gets like a final exam. It's almost like law school where you get one exam. You know, you can look at the webinars or whatever, but the bottom line is I'm going to send you samples and templates, and I want you to look at those samples and look at those templates, and I want you to give me your best possible work product describing your invention based on the samples and templates. And, of course, this is after you think that you want to go after. But, uh, you know, depending on how you want to work, whether you want to search it or not, you know, I'm very variable. Uh, but once you want to work with me, we engage, and then, you know, we start working together, and, and uh, you know, I work with my method, which is basically trying to teach you what I know, you know so that I can make it as efficient as possible. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks. 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 Thanks